Carol Kane. I'm a consultant for the CAF Rise Above WASP program. Our discussion today is called My Journey with the WASP, and I'm here with author Sarah Byrne Rickman. Sarah is a nationally recognized authority on the WAFs and the WASP and has written 12 books about these women pilots who flew America's military aircraft in World War II. Her first book, the original, is considered the definitive history of the Women Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron. Hi, Sarah, good to see you. Hey, Carol, it's good to see you and thank you. That's a wonderful introduction. I really like that, thank well, you. We've been friends a long time and I know how talented you are. But how, how did you come to write the book, The Originals? Okay, I will tell you, it all came about because of one woman, Nancy Batson Cruz, who was one of the original WAFs. And I met her in 1999. She had come up to Ohio for a filming that we were doing at the International Women's Air and Space Museum. And I got to know her. And I said, Nancy, I, you know, I would love to write your, uh, your biography. And she said, no, Sarah. She was from Alabama. I said, no, Sarah. I want you to write about Nancy Love and the WAFs. And I was astounded. And I said, how? How am I, you know, I, I come from a little town named Centerville, Ohio. Nobody knows who I am or what I'm after. Why would these women even want to talk to me? And they've probably been talked out. And she said, oh, you don't have to worry about that. I will have a reunion. I will invite them to Birmingham. Um, she, she was from Birmingham, Alabama. So I will invite them to Birmingham and we will have a reunion. And by darn, she got, there was still nine alive at that point. Nancy got five others to come, and we had a reunion. I got to meet these women, talk to them. I filmed interviews with them, and I, that was how I got the start to writing the originals. Of course, I still had to write it. There was more to come, but it did come. And also, let me tell you that those films that I shot in 1999 later became my documentary movie, Six Wafts Up Close and Personal, which we're going to see here in just a second. Let's watch Sarah's film, Six Wafts Up Close and Personal. I was about three and a half years old, and in a field nearby, an airplane had had a forced landing. And I can see it to this day. It was yellow. It, I know I know now it was a biplane. I think it was a JF-4D, I'm pretty sure that it was. And from that day, I fell in love. And I stayed in love all my life with that airplane or with airplanes. And the guys were getting $6 an hour and I was lucky to get $4 an hour. Okay. Until I got a good rep, and when I got a good rep, then they wanted to fly with me. Because my none of my students ever failed. I was in Montreal checking out on an AT-6 to go over to England. You Sis Bernheim was up there at the same time. Okay. That's where I first met her. And we've heard about Nancy's program by seeing in the paper. And then one of us called and found out about it. And uh, they told us to come on down. They would be, they'd love to talk to us. For the, uh, just before Nancy announced. Because I was number eight to join. Well, I didn't hear about it until I received my telegram. Uh, inviting me to join the organization if I had certain qualifications. I had everything except the horsepower rating. So uh, it was a, I think it was a 200 horsepower rating we had to have. Report this station at your own expense immediately for an interview and flight check. Stop. Advise, stop, love, and Baker, which was the CEO of the base. So this was my notification that I was accepted to come to Wilmington at my own expense to take a flight check and a physical to see whether I could become one of the group. He never expected a woman to ever use her train. No, and I went out to take my flight check and I passed that. I was hired to learn how to do it the Army way. Oh, we got an airplane delivered. We were part of the ferry command. Women's Auxiliary 
bearing squadron. But this was the start. This was the first group of 25 and were accepted into this experimental group. When I got my telegram, it was uh, signed Love Baker. <laughs> and I said, I don't know a Colonel Baker <laughs> and sending his love. What's this all about? Well, I found out it was Nancy Love. And when I was flying at Boston, I knew Nancy Love because her husband uh, owned uh, Intercity Airways. Well, Nancy was uh, single-minded on what her purpose was. Her feeling was that the ability of taking women who already knew how to fly and were capable of stepping in with very little training to ferrying airplanes was, was her gain. And with the fact that there were probably only maybe a hundred women in the United States at that point in time that had the requirements, maybe two squadrons, possibly a third as the girls accumulated the time. But that was the maximum that probably was going to be set up. Not to cost the government anything, that these trained women would come in and meld into the system, relieve the men for combat with absolutely no really turmoil, no tra no extra training, and so forth. So the amount of women that could do that was very limited. Now Jackie's idea was that it could be a big organization and we could take any girl off the street out of any form of life and her job and train them to be a pilot. Uh, there were, were 25, 26 of us young ladies we had to learn how to do it the Army way. If you've been in the Army, you know there's a right way, wrong way, and the Army way. Then we started ferrying. My first trip was a Cub from um, Lock Haven, Pennsylvania to New Orleans. And there were a group of about six of us all going in the same general direction. It was cold. Ground was completely covered with snow. The only thing you could see would be a railroad or a road, but otherwise the complete landscape was covered with snow. And of course we had no radios, we had no navigation, we had a needle ball, airspeed, oil temperature, and oil <laughs> pressure gauge. And I think it's uh, IFR, I follow the railroad. I say today I don't know how we ever found Greensboro, North Carolina. It was solid snow. No way of telling which way to go except that we had a map and we went from town to town with our finger on the map and holding a compass heading and uh, we managed to find where we were going every time. Yeah, that's the Fairchild PT-19. See, we used to go over and get those at uh, Hagerstown, Maryland. My first trip was from uh, Hagerstown down to Tennessee, and Helen Mary Clark was my flight leader. And that was cold. I thought I was going to freeze to death. first leg, then we picked these up at Great Falls, Montana, uh -huh. and the first trip was to go to Billings. Billings. We had orders, six of us had orders to go from Wilmington, Delaware, to go out there in Great Falls, Montana and pick up these six steamers in December, in December. 1942. Burr. Snow on the ground, uh -huh. Uh -huh. frozen ponds everywhere, you know. We had all those heavy flying shoes, you know, yeah. fleece line, yeah. and these boots and, and everything, and we had face masks. Uh -huh. I was still cold. We went up to Great Falls to pick up the steermas to take them to Jackson, Tennessee. And uh, on this same trip, there were 17 male pilots that went along on this trip. And the reason I mention that is because the six wafts made in record time in the bad weather, uh, the six male pilots out of 17 made it to Jackson, Tennessee. This is where we proved how good we could fly. <laughs> and bless the wafts that made it through. I was going to tell you about the heavy heat, heat the oil. It was so cold up there, and, and uh, I told Florine that she could take the first leg. The flight leader stays in the back and hurts the... You were the flight leader. Yeah, okay. the flight leader. And um, I noticed that uh, after we were up for a while, I guess maybe 40 miles or so, Florine started to slow down. The, the whole flight started slowing down, and we were sort of, we weren't in a close formation. One airplane got behind Florine, the next one kept going, and it kept getting slower and slower, and I didn't know what was happening. I thought they were having some kind of engine problem. And Florine made a turn, and everybody started following her around. And we had no means of communication. So after everybody followed her around, she spotted, she remembered something about a field. I didn't know this. We had no checkpoints because the, all Montana, it was snow covered. Everything was just like almost a whiteout. And we went in to the emergency strip. And in fact, I didn't even see the emergency strip. Uh, 
because it was all one. The eagle eye spotted this thing, <laughs> and and as uh, somebody had shoveled the snow, and there was just snow banks on either side. And I was so proud of those girls. One by one, they went in. And you know, they was that airplane was known as a ground looping airplane. And they must have stood right on those riders and went all the way straight in. But uh, we turned around and we got out of there. When we found out that Florian's map had blown out of the, the cockpit. And of course, Batson was sitting on her map. <laughs> <laughs> that was the last time that happened, too. When I took over and got, we got out of there, I said, let's have hand signals. We couldn't stop the airplanes. So the next stop, wherever to get gas, I said, we're going to have hand signals from now on. In case something happens, we acknowledge what we're trying to tell with the hand signals, the hand lighting. So uh, that's how we got cross country on and got out of Billings, Montana. <laughs> but we were very fortunate on that. We plow into one of those banks. Oh, we had, tr we had more trouble on it. I noticed that uh, Catherine Rawls, uh, started circling around uh, the airplane uh, uh, and she's pointing for it to get down and then the other girls started circling and they came back up and I, I I didn't know what was happening and I got into the closest space and here I, I found out whatever octane gas they were using was going through the hoses and picking up little pieces of the hose and the engines was cutting in tanks. that's what held us up there for a few days they had drained the tank so mm -hmm. it was gunkin as they say yeah because we could all have been forced landing if we unfortunately we were close to a base right. Stimulus was the war, and the fact that the biggest need that we had uh, in the mid-43 was the fact that we there was a need for fighter airplanes. It's easier just to send a single girl in an airplane on a trip than it was to send her as a co-pilot with a man. So the idea of sending air, women by themselves was kind of interesting, particularly to the guy's wives. So I think that uh, was one of the sidelights <laughs> to this. But the big push was for fighter airplanes. It was what we really needed. To. I flew my first P-47 at Wilmington, Delaware. I got checked out in it then. You're, you're concentrating on what you're doing. Right. And you don't think to, what are, what's going through my mind other than, am I following procedure? Boy, here, here I am, flying something like this. I never dreamt I'd be flying. We were just happy to fly Piper Coast, mm -hmm. PT-19s, flying all over the country and getting paid for it mm -hmm. and getting per diem. What more do you want? First, first pursuit I flew, I was checked out by Doc Livingston in Palm Springs before pursuit school really started. One Sunday morning, and all I can remember him saying is just watch your right foot because we were flying with 2,000 horsepower and a great big four-bladed propeller out in front that when that thing turned we were going to get um, such a twist to the airplane that we were going to have to have our right foot on the rudders in order to maintain directional control down the runway but everybody did it the boys did it just like the girls and once you checked out in it then your next morning you were on orders and probably the first place you go with the P-51 would be Newark, New Jersey and that's about eight hours away and then from Newark, did they put them on a boat or something? Newark, they put them on a boat and set them to um, the European theater. By this time, of course, we're having a whole lot of pursuit planes being manufactured. Okay. On the east coast was the P-47s, and on the west coast you had the P-51s. The, uh, the P-38. P-38. And they needed pursuit pilots, you know, to right. ferry them to, mostly we took them to Newark, New Jersey. The actual flight transition was in Palm Springs because that was the beginning of pursuit schools. Transition had a, had a very set policy of what you do. I mean, we were given a manual to read. Uh, we studied it. We took a uh, written test. We went out and sat in the cockpit for a long period of time till we knew where everything was. We learned all the uh, emergency systems, the emergency gear system, the flap system, the fuel system, and so forth. So the idea of getting checked out in pursuit became very, very a prominent part of our life in early 44. That the rule came down that every girl that stayed in the ferry command had to be checked out in single engine pursuit because that was going to be the big push. Some of them didn't want to fly pursuit. Some of them uh, didn't pass pursuit school. Everybody didn't graduate. They had to have certain qualifications and 
being civilians, they were either allowed to quit and go home, or they could ask for a transfer, and several of the girls transferred to other commands, other jobs, and uh, they just preferred not to fly pursuit airplane. We were pretty well qualified in everything up the step that, that was available in that particular area. And I did go up through four engines, so I was what they call a 5P pilot. It's not the fact that the B-17 was that big a push and probably there weren't too many others that were going to get checked out because it really wasn't the big need. It was the fact that it was done, a girl could do it, I was the squadron commander and it made me a 5P pilot. Do it, But we weren't needed to fly B-17s. The, the real need was to fly the P-38s and the P-51s and the P-47s because those were what were going to win the war. In 1944, I was based mainly at uh, Republic Aircraft on, uh, flew the C-60, uh, and then we had to have uh, instrument rating. Mm -hmm. And I got my instrument rating at Wilmington. And the reason I got that on the C-60 is that many times when I'd go up to uh, Long Island, some days I'd be flying P-47, sometimes a C-60. What we used it for was uh, to bring the pilots back, back to Long Island so we could take another trip with the P-47. We took off towards the east. We could just make a great big circle around Long Island and make it 30 minutes. Wow. So uh, uh, sometimes we would deliver four and five airplanes a day, especially if uh, the weather had been bad and the airplanes were parked on the runways and they had to get them off in order to get them more airplanes on the apron strip. So uh, it was Teresa James and I would alternate on the C-60s. She would try to land the C-60 shorter than I did, and I believe she went out. Then the right. summer of 44, I was sent to Evansville, Indiana. There was a modification place for P-47s. And, okay. uh, and I think you've seen that picture. We stand in front of a P-47 yeah. and, the, and the control officer's right here and I'm standing next to him. Yeah. And then we were lined up and some of them on top of the wing. Yep, I've seen that one. And, yeah. um, so I was sort of in charge of the group there. Okay. And Nancy Love had gotten us a house. She had rented us a house in town, in Evansville. Okay. And that's, we used that as our BOQ. We picked up P-51s from North American and DC-3s from Douglas and took them wherever they were going to be used. And then we, we were just ferrying them from the point of where they were built to where they were going to be stationed. If there was a push for getting P-51s out of North American, then we all flew P-51s. We took most of the 51s and 38s to Newark, where they took the wings off and put them on a ship and shipped them to Europe. made my approach, not being able to see ahead in, in this airplane, and certainly with the haze that day, it was about 10 feet lower than I intended to be. And I flew right straight into a telephone pole, the pole that had many crossbars on it, but a strong enough telephone pole that I hit that didn't even knock the pole down. It caused the nose of the airplane to shoot straight up and start to roll on its back. And here I am as high as a telephone pole off the ground at reduced power and full flaps. Well, I hit that and all of a sudden it started screaming in my ear and jerked those controls and as a matter of fact, to roll that thing out without hitting the ground. And now I was on the runway to start with. By the time it went up and I rolled it out, I was way out here in the grass area, way out in the middle of the field and heading right straight into a hangar. Well, I had full power on, of course, and the airplane was just, just mushing. And at the same time it was mushing, the vibration, as I hit the pole, the vibration started. And I'm telling you, my whole cockpit uh, panel was vibrating to the extent I could not read an instrument. Well, and as I was flying out, I had to hold hard left rudder and right stick. And so I was sitting crooked in the seat all the time, flying, trying to keep the nose of that airplane straight ahead. And full power, and the thing just chug, chug, chugging along. Well, I thought, oh, if I just get over the top of this hangar, uh, and get enough altitude, I'm getting the heck out of here. And so uh, I turned around to go back to the airport. And what did I see? But nothing but black sky, mm. black. Everything was black. No mm. airport mm. anywhere. That airport had to be there. Geographically, it had to be there. It was there, but it had no lights on.
turned on the landing latch, and at the back of this runway was the same long line of transmission, line of those in the back end that you had to fly over to make your approach. If I had no altimeter, I could tell how high I was. I was at full power, full speed, and I didn't have any extra anything to get over. Mm -hmm. And whether or not I could pull up and not stall the airplane with no more power mm -hmm. to do it or not was another thing. And I said, oh, well, I have and I was on top of the sagebrush. <laughs> oh my. Going in. But I was lined up with the runway just fine. Here are all of these silver airplanes landing on each other. They were that close to me, planes, and I knew where I was. Got that thing in position, pulled that third of the power back, and boy, that thing uh, sat down, no bounce left in it. Oh. It sat down three point landing, as pretty as you ever saw, and <laughs> sat there and never <laughs> bounced a whit. Off. Before I even, I think, turned the switch off to stop the, the prop going, somebody jumped on the wing, opened the canopy, <gasps> stuck his head in. Guess who? Commanding officer. Oh my, oh my gosh, he was so glad I got down. And, well, I thought later, no wonder he didn't want anything to happen on his watch. The airplane has a four bladed prop about that much. A foot of one prop was melted off and <gasps> gone. Wonder it vibrated. It was vibrating oh. on that because the engine should have fallen should out. Fall. Well, sure enough, under the airplane, from the engine nacelle clear back to the tail wheel, it was ripped open just like a can opener. And here was a sweet little old tail wheel still intact. I would have crashed into the planes if that tail wheel had not been there. I could not have controlled the airplane. And I finally got out of the cockpit there onto the wing, and I was not even half out of it till a maintenance man who went right to the side of me up on the wing, and he jumps in the cockpit, and sure enough, his foot goes right through the floor. Well, the next day, uh, they told me that uh, they checked in the gas tanks, and I didn't have anything but vapor in the gas oh. tanks. Not anything. Oh my. Dry. But sure enough, it, I had enough that I turned the switch off. It didn't quit me. They all flew single engine pursuit. And that's really what was needed. In one day, there'd be 50 airplanes sitting on the airport oh. that had to be delivered that day. So we all, when we came back from a trip at night, checked in turned our papers in, then we were on the list for the following morning. So you'd go home and wash your clothes, iron your shirt, report to headquarters and operations in the morning, and the first airplane that came up on the list that you, opposite your name, that you were checked out in, was your trip for the day. You never knew what kind of an airplane you were going to get any one day. How many days did it take you to fly a P-51 to Newark, New Jersey? A day and a half, probably if the weather was good. Just. But normally it takes about eight hours. That's amazing. But it takes time. You had to fuel probably at least three times. The word came down that we were through December 20th. 30 or so P-51 sitting at Long Beach Airport the morning I went home. And 40 of my girls all got in their car and drove home instead of ferrying those airplanes. And it broke my heart. Sarah, it was wonderful to see these women in person and to hear them tell their story. But Nancy Love was sort of an unsung hero in the story of these women who flew these aircraft during World War II. Yes. You want me to tell a little bit of how all that came about? I'd love to know. Okay. Well, Nancy, Nancy had some connections already. Uh, her husband, Bob, uh, was part of the ferry command, so she was well acquainted with, uh, with the men really already. And she was asked to talk to Colonel, Colonel William Tunner, who was the head of the ferrying division, uh, because, <clears throat> excuse, me, after World, uh, excuse me, after Pearl Harbor, the United States was caught without enough men, ships, munitions, tanks, you want an, uh, airplanes, and really enough men to fight the war. So, of course, the, the men were flocking to, uh, to the, the army induction stations to join uh, because this was patriotic. But in the meantime, all of the, the, all of the male pilots who really were capable of, of, of flying, excuse me, let me re reframe that, all of <clears throat> the male pilots already in the Army Air Forces were called back from any other duties in order to, to get ready for combat. So Colonel Tunner, who, whose job it was to get 
the newly newly built <clears throat> excuse me got a, got a frog the newly built uh, primary trainer airplanes from the factory down to the flight flight training schools which were located mostly in the south all of a sudden these planes are coming off uh, off the production line and there's no one to ferry them to where they can be used by the men well, what Nancy Love did is when she went to talk to Colonel Tunner, she said, I know of approximately 100 women pilots who are capable of flying these aircraft for you. And he was interested. Tell me more. And, and how can you find these women? She said, well, I know most of them and those I don't, I can get in touch with. And he said that that really that that made his day. He said, OK, I'm hiring you. To, to get those women in the fold, uh, contact them and ask them to come and fly for us. And Nancy did. Are you interested in how that came about? Yeah, yes, I can't imagine trying to locate these women. How did, how did Nancy find the women that were qualified to enter this program? Well, she already, she already had a good list of them. And what she did is, in the first place, uh, Colonel Tunner, put her in touch with uh, with Colonel Bob Baker, who was the new commander of uh, the, of the uh, uh, excuse me, Newcastle Army Air Base located in Wilmington, Delaware. He was the one who was going to need these pilots be to ferry the aircraft, which were built just a hundred or so miles away in Hagerstown, Maryland. So Bob Baker and Nancy Love put their heads together and they sent out telegrams on September 5th, 1942, to these 100, uh, well, it turned out to be 83 women that Nancy actually uh, came up with, with their names uh, that they would qualify. They sent out 83 telegrams that day and asked them to come to Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, and uh, when these women began to arrive at Newcastle, they had to pass a flight test to prove they really could fly. And they also had to pass a physical. So as they came in, each woman was sent to do that. And then Nancy Love would meet with them afterwards and tell them if they qualified or not. Well, the women began to qualify and it wasn't very fast. Uh, it took a few days, uh, a couple of weeks to get into this. The first two women to report were first Betty Gillies, a friend of Nancy's, 34 years old, who already who had something like 1,200 hours. She was, and she also was a founding 99. She was a really, really good pilot. And then right after her came Cornelia Fort, who also had a lot of hours. She was close to 1,000. And she was the, was the third WAFs to qualify. Well, this went on through, uh, through September and into October. And finally, uh, the, the, uh, Nancy had her tw the 25 women, which is what the original idea was uh, to start this group. And what they did is they had to, uh, to then do an orientation of 30 days in which they learned to fly the Army way. There's a specific way to fly for the Army, and any civilian had no idea. So everyone who came in had to learn to fly that way. Those women learned. And then they began to ferry uh, the PT-19 primary trainer, which was built at Hagerstown, Maryland, the Fairchild factory. And with that, the WAFs were off and running. Well, Sarah, in the, in the fall of 1942, Jacqueline Cochran with General Hap Arnold had started a flight training school. <clears throat> how, how did that impact the WAFs program? Okay, <clears throat> very good question. What, what actually the ferrying division needed was really more women pilots than the 25 WAFs that had been recruited. There would be three more WAFs. That's just an, an addendum. There were 28 altogether. But that wasn't going to do it. They needed way more pilots. And that's why Arnold had, uh, had okayed uh, Jackie Cochran to to organize this flight training school down in Texas, and this was Army run, in order to train more young women how to fly the Army way, 
so that they could become uh, could, be, could become ferry pilots. The incoming women did not have as many hours as the WAFs did, but at the beginning, the ones with the most number of hours started started to come in, classes one and two. Okay, what followed this then is that in December, because we knew the girls were coming from Cochran's, uh, from, from the flight school, Nancy Love was sent out to talk to the other six ferrying bases uh, from which uh, women might be able to ferry uh, these primary trainers. She visited all six and three of them said, yes, they would house a woman squadron. Romulus, Michigan, Dallas, Texas, and Long Beach, California. So Nancy went back and the 1st of January, she divided the then 25 WAFs into four groups. She sent five, five of them to Romulus, Michigan, five of them to Dallas, Texas, and five of them to Long Beach. And she kept 10 in Wilmington because by then their ferrying program was already going strong. Those women moved out to their, their, new, their new spots and started a, just a fledgling women's, uh, excuse me, uh, women's squadron there. These women coming from the flight training school were going to enlarge that a few at a time. Now, the biggest problem happened when the flight school was not able to finish their training in time. The women were supposed to come the end of February. They ended up coming the end of April. So in the meantime, the WAFs pretty much had to carry it all by themselves. And they did. Now, Nancy Love, who always was thinking ahead, knew that she wanted her girls to ferry something more than primary trainers. She knew they were capable. And she asked Tunner's permission. He gave it for her to start checking out in whatever she felt she could handle. And she could handle just about anything. She was the first woman, first American woman well, living here, not counting the, the ones who went to England. She was the first to check out in the P-51 fighter, which became the premier fighter that the U.S. had uh, in, in World War II. Two weeks later, that was in February. Two weeks later, Betty Gillies checked out in the P uh, the P forty seven, the big biggest of the uh, of the fighter aircraft that America had. Betty was five one and a half. This plane was a monster. Her husband be, built her, uh, 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 and I'm lo I'm losing the word uh, blocks, wooden blocks to put over the rudders so she could reach the pedals. And daggone if that little little thing didn't reach the pedals and she blew the pants off a piece of uh, uh, P-47s the rest of the war. After those two had broken the ice, some of the other more advanced WAFs began to also ferry, uh, excuse me, not ferry yet, but to learn to fly the pursuit aircraft. Uh, when, uh, well, primarily the ones out in, in California, very quickly were put in, in some of those early P-51s and they began to learn how to fly them. Some total is that seven of Nancy's women, including herself, were qualified to fly fighter aircraft by the end of the summer, by the end of August. Here is why that was important. The war had turned, the worm had turned is a, is a, is a way to say it. And Hap Arnold knew this and, uh, now, General Tunner also knew this. The idea was that we were ready to start sending fighter aircraft overseas to fight, well, primarily G Germany. That, that was our main target at that time. And all of a sudden, the need for those pilots was greater than the need for ferrying smaller aircraft anymore. Everything had moved forward. So... General Tunner had been thinking for a long time about starting what is called a pursuit school. Initially, men would transition, which means learn how to fly these larger aircraft and these big, these, these big pursuits. Uh, they would learn on base. Well, this was kind of, kind of the harder way of doing it. His idea was to start, uh, start uh, 
was to open a pursuit school where classes of say 40, 45 or so at a time could learn to fly all four of the major pursuits that the United States had had in the game now. That was established to start the 1st of December, 1943. Yeah, we're in, 40, we're in 43 now. Okay. Already, seven of Nancy's girls have proved that they could do this. So most of the remaining WAFs and several of the women from the first two classes uh, that had been learning, uh, learning to fly down in Texas, they were good enough pilots. They, too, qualified. So the first two classes in December had about eight women each, half of them WAFs, the other half were what the women who are now called WASP. I've got to go back just a second now to explain that. As of the summer of 1943, remember, we've now got these WAF squadrons established and we're starting to send young women from the flight training school there. Okay, Jackie Cochran decided that she didn't want the women that she had, had well, she didn't train them herself, but the women that she had brought into the program she didn't want them flying for Nancy Love. She wanted her own little Air Force. So she went to, uh, to Hap Arnold, and she suggested that she be made the director of women pilots over all of them. He bought it. He pretty well trusted her by then, so this, this makes sense. But that kind of put Nancy Love at a loss, except that General Tunner said, no one is commanding my WAFs. Excuse me. They were now called WASP, too. No one is commanding them except Nancy Love. So Jackie Cochran became the director of women pilots and Nancy Love was given complete command over the ferry, the women ferry pilots. She still was under Cochran, but she controlled the women ferry pilots at General Tunner's command. Now we're set for pursuit school. When we get into the fall, as I told you before, the worm is turned. Hap Arnold knows it. General Tunner knows it, and they know they've got to train more, a lot more pilots. Well, we don't have a lot of women, but we still have men coming in uh, who are already now in the service. They've learned to fly up through uh, through advanced uh, advanced uh, uh, trainers. So we're going to send them all to pursuit school. It was opened in Palm Springs, California, on the first of December. About 40 men and about eight women reported, and that continued on afterwards, well, beyond what we need to go into now. That is how the WAFs and the women that Cochran and Arnold were training down in Texas became one in the summer of 1943 under the name, the new name of the WASP, Women Air Force Service Pilots. All of them took that name. That's what they, there was a uniform change. All, we don't need, need to go into all of that. There was a uniform change all. And these women continued to train for some time. I'm not even going to go into the end of it because that's not part of the story now. What I've got, what you've got now, you who are listening, is we've arrived at December of 1943. We are building a cadre of more pursuit pilots who are desperately needed because we're going to go to war. No, excuse me, we're already at war. We're going to start uh, uh, start fighting, excuse me, start bombing and all in, uh, in Germany. We need fighter aircraft protection. That's what those planes are for, particularly the P-51s. They were the most critical plane ferried. And let me tell you, it's still a barely known fact that it was the women pilots, the WASP who flew for the ferrying division throughout 1944. They did a job that hardly anybody knows about. The most important thing that all those women, 1,102 women became WASP, 134 of them, 135, excuse me, 135 were flying those pursuit aircraft that were desperately needed. This needs to be told. And that's why that's why I've told the story in the originals and all the other books. So that I think that's enough for now, probably too much. So Carol, I'll give it back to you.
Well, uh, Sarah, each of these 1,102 uh, women has her own personal story to tell, each yes. a wonderful story. Yes. Uh, and you have written 12 books about these women. And the latest is Jean Landis, Wasp Pilot, 2,500 miles, Long Beach to Newark in a P-51. And her nephew, Devin Scott, is going to be joining us to tell about his Aunt Jean. Yes, on our next broadcast, yes, yes. That's wonderful. And Sarah, your book, it, <laughs> the original, and the other 11 books are all available online at the Commemorative Air Force Rise Above Wasp Bookstore. Wonderful yes. reading for anyone who's interested in World War II, are the women, the first women to fly America's military aircraft. Yes. Let me, let me add one little thing to that. The last five of those 12 books are written for young women, about age, uh, age 11 on up to even adults. Yeah, adults would like them to. But my target now is for young women of today to know about these remarkable women pilots, all 1,102 of them. Well, Sarah, it's been wonderful spending this time with you, and I'm looking forward to hearing you and Devin Scott talk about his Aunt Jean. Excellent. Thank you, Carol. And, and remember, you're going to be in on that conversation, too, so you've got your two oh, cents. <laughs> I would not miss that for the world. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Bye, Carol. Thanks.